around us is constantly changing and it is constantly changing us. One of the most profound ways that the world has changed over the last 20 years and has profoundly changed us is the rise of the internet and access to it through smart devices. Or really what I'm referring to is the, the rise of the information age or the digital age. Now this kind of technology, cell phones, internet has become such a foundational part of our lives. It's hard to think about life before that was available. Uh, and yet it's only been about 20 years. So I can remember back to when I first got a cell phone, when they were first available. And for me, that was second year university uh, when I first got a cell phone. Before that was still like a pager. So a lot has changed even since then, since my first little Alcatel cell phone. A lot has changed in the world since then, and we have changed a lot since then as well. And I think we all intuitively know that the rise of the internet age, the information age, we know it has profoundly shaped us. So Tony Reinke puts it like this. He says, we all seem to sense that for good or bad, our smartphones are changing us, our habits, and our relationships. We all know it. We feel it. We seem to be more productive and yet we are more distracted. We seem to be more connected and yet we are more alone. We seem to be more knowledgeable and yet we are less likely to understand the very purpose of our lives. Do you sense that? I'd love to just interrogate that statement for a little bit because I feel like it's really helpful for us. So has technology and the rise of the digital age, has it helped us be more productive? The answer is, of course, yes. Just think about everything that has happened because of it, like the immense processing power available to us in the latest microchips combined with the wealth of information out there plus all of the smart tools that are being created has enabled immense acceleration of technology and development for society. I mean, for example, would we have a viable vaccine today as quickly as we have it without this technology that's available to us. And so, yes, it's helping us be more productive, but then also, let me ask you, are you more productive now with all the tools and resources that you have. So, so I'm a little bit of a, like a productivity nerd. I love all these little hacks and these apps and things that are supposed to help you with your productivity. I would say that I'm more organized than I've ever been before. And yet I would also say I'm possibly still more stressed than I ever was before. And part of that is what Tony Reinger kind of alludes to is we are more distracted than ever before. Did you know that when, if you're busy working on something and a notification comes up, right? Notifications, whether on your computer, on your smartwatch, on your phone, when you're distracted and you're forced to look at something else, or you pick up your phone in the middle of work, do you know it takes 25 minutes for you to reset and get back to what you were doing before. And research shows that we are distracted now through notifications, email, etc. every 11 minutes. So every 11 minutes you're distracted for a full 25 minutes before you can go back again. So just do the maths with all the productivity tools out there. Are you more productive? Secondly, it talks about relationships. So has the digital age, and with that Web 2.0, so the rise of social media, has that helped us to do relationships better? And the answer is, well, yes. On the one hand, we're far more connected to people, and today we get to do this. We're not able to gather together, but because of internet and technology, we're able to gather together in some way as a community. So yes, but also no. And Tony again alluded to this in the quote, one of the most peculiar features of the internet age is the abundant loneliness. We are more connected than ever before, but still more isolated. 
than ever before. There's even a term for that. It is called networked individualism. Networked individualism. We're connected, but we're not in fruitful relationship with all the abundance of people that we are connected to. So Generation Z, so that's the generation that they, they're called digital natives because they've been born, they've grown up in a world of smartphones, unlike myself and, and most of you listening there who are digital immigrants, digital natives. Generation Z, or the iGen, as they call them now, live their lives through their phones, but research has shown that Generation Z uh, is marked by rising rates of depression, loneliness, anxiety, sleeplessness, and suicidal thoughts. And I think we all just know as well with the people that we are in physical contact with just how disruptive technology is in real life relationships. So I'm trying to think of a way to like tie this to Valentine's Day, right? But here it is. You're on a date. If you're on a date, leave your cell phone in the car, right? In front of you, the worst thing is you're sitting with somebody and they take a call or they're checking their phones, right? Leave your phone in the car. You're welcome, right? That's how just technology disrupts. This was really brought home to me, you know, quite recently where uh, I was just sitting one day on the couch and I'm kind of, it's the end of the day and I'm just kind of browsing, not really doing anything fruitful on my phone and the kids are around and Emma Rose is trying to get my attention. And eventually she kind of angrily says, Daddy, put down your phone. She's two years old and she was looking for my attention and I was distracted by my phone, nothing important. So I think we know how disruptive technology has been even in the real life relationships that we have. The third point that he kind of alludes to in this quote is, has the abundance of information out there, has it made us wiser? I mean, one would think with the tons of information out there. In 2019, four and a half million YouTube videos were viewed every minute. I wonder what that is today. With all the information and access to information out there, you would think with all that knowledge, we're smarter, we're wiser. Well, let me ask you, do you feel like our generation or the world today is making better decisions? about their lives, or what Tony Ranka points to, the very purpose of our lives. For sure, our world has more and more information, but it's become less and less wise. That's not to mention the psychological effects destructive effects that technology has on us when we're constantly comparing our lives to the curated perfect lives of other people on social media or being faced with all the social events we are missing out on that we weren't invited to. That's not to mention the physical effects of our brains living in what they call a, a high, constant heightened state of stress because of constantly needing to multitask leading to sleeplessness, anxiety, obesity and all sorts of other physical problems. That's not to mention the emotional effects that this is having on us when we are bombarded every day in the news by every bad thing happening everywhere at all times in the world, things that we can do nothing about except worry and panic about all the ways the world is trying to kill us these days. Technology is a powerful force that is truly shaping the world but also shaping us. And while a lot of it is positive and for good, a lot of it is also destructive. Now the point of the sermon is not to motivate you all to become Luddites. If you don't know what that means, Google it. It's a fascinating story. Not Luddites or digital monks. The answer is not to retreat from all access to internet and all technology. But the answer is also not to just naively carry on, kind of without any sense of how it is shaping us. Our approach has got to be intentionally discerning and disciplined in how we engage with technology. Instead of 
uncritically embracing everything out there. We need to practice discernment. And instead of an unrestrained engagement with technology, practice discipline. Discernment and discipline. I've already given you a few reasons why we need to do that. All of the physical, social, all those motivations, why we need to be disciplined and discerning. But I want to spend a little bit of time on another aspect of our lives, a critical part of our Christian lives that has been so fundamentally shaped by the rise of the internet age, mostly without us realizing it. And that is in our quest or our search for truth. Let's talk about truth for a few minutes. For a Christian, the idea of truth or truth matters. For a Christian, truth matters very much. God is described as himself as truth. John 17 verse 3, this is eternal life that you may know the only true God. Jesus declared himself the way the truth and the life and the Holy Spirit, the third now member of the Trinity, is referred to as the spirit of truth. Truth is not just an attribute of God. God is truth. It's at the very heart of the nature of God is truth. On the opposite side of the spectrum, the devil is known as what in the Bible? Most often, he's referred to as the father of anti-truth, lies. Jesus says in John 8, you are of your father, the devil, your will is to do your father, the devil's desire. He was a murderer. He does not stand in truth. There is no truth in him. The devil is defined as one in which there is no truth. God is defined as one who is embodies truth. When he lies, the devil, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You get the message? For a Christian, truth matters. And listen, now, more than ever before, we have to be so careful about what is truth. Because what is true is being shaped around us by the internet age. So in 2016, Oxford Dictionaries, every year Oxford Dictionaries releases what they call the word of the year. It's the most popular word of the year. If you're interested, go check out what the word of the year for 2020 was. Turns out there were so many words, they're just calling it the disruptive, disruptive word of the year last year, right? But in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary word of the year, let's get this, post-truth. Post-truth. It was the word of the year in 2016. This is what post-truth is defined as. It's defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Post-truth was the word of the year. That's crazy, stunningly. With all this access to information, which should lead to an abundance of facts, has led us to a post-truth age. And actually, if you step back and think about it, it's very clear how this has happened. When you become aware of some of the ways that this technology works around us, I want to point out just two of those ways to you. It's been so important for me to just realize a large part of what I'm doing today is just simply making us aware. Because if we're unaware of how we're being shaped, then we will naturally be shaped in its negative ways. That's all I'm doing is awareness. So here you've got to know two ways in which truth is being shaped simply by the principles on which the internet age operates. So number one is um, confirmation bias. So for example, if you want to find out anything. You don't know something? I've already mentioned it to you a couple of times. Like, hey, you want to know what a Luddite is? What do you do? Right, you go Google it. 
Uh, and if you want to be really academic about something, you may go you know, straight to Wikipedia. And Google and Wikipedia are incredible tools, but there are some inherent built-in principles that when it comes to the pursuit of truth, are fundamentally shaping the way we search for truth. So for Google, it's the principle, the principle on which Google operates is the principle of relevance. The thousands, millions of search results that get generated while Google is so successful is because it returns to you on that first page the results most relevant to you based on your search history, based on the profile that Google has created for you. And by the way, you can go into Google and you just Google per ad settings and you can see the profile that Google has developed for you. Right, I just had a look at mine this morning and it, yeah, it mentions bikes, it mentions coffee, weirdly it mentions country music, who knows where that came from, Chris and probably hacked into my account at that point. I mean, it's amazing, it's out there. According to your profile, it will return results. That's why it's so brilliant. Because it's returning what's relevant to you. But just think about that for a second. When you're searching for answers, it's giving you answers relevant to who you already are, to what your preferences already are, to what your biases already are. I tried this as an example. Google, what is Islam? I remember I did this a while ago. And uh, to Google's credit, it seems to have changed a little bit. But I remember I did it a while ago and looked at what is Islam. So now, based on my search history and all the research I do for sermons, it's clear I'm a Christian. And Google returned to me, number one result is an article on Islam written by a Christian website. So it's a Christian's view of Islam. And results five to seven were Christian views of Islam. And that's not Google, you know, trying to pull me. It's just returning results that are relevant to me based on who I already am. In other words, search engines, which you need to curate all the information in the world, are returning to us results or information that is most relevant to us. And let me tell you, all social media sites, all of the algorithms that return to us people to follow or friends that we have, which is taking that mass of information and bringing it to us personally, work on this principle. Giving us ideas, giving us information that already, already suits who we are and what we think. So these, these algorithms are built on this idea, it's called filter bubbles where the results are returned based on, on what you think. And that leads to what is now known as echo chambers, echo chambers. We really just, there's, there's these echoing thoughts going around. You're never really exposed to what is objective when you're looking for answers on the internet. You're only encountering opinions that already reflect your own opinions, which means people aren't being challenged outside of their preconceived ideas of truth. What you already believe is being reinforced, reinforced. And listen, if this got all technical and you've checked out for a second, self-reinforced ignorance is a dangerous thing. Self-reinforced ignorance is a dangerous thing and that is dangerously inherent in the way we navigate the internet. Second way current internet age is shaping our pursuit of truth is not just when we're looking for answers on Google, but as we automatically receive it, i.e. news. And yes, I'm going to get onto my hobby horse about fake news. So researchers from MIT did a groundbreaking study on the articles posted on Twitter since its inception. So they, they researched contested stories that came out since its inception, so over 126,000 stories to find out which of those stories were true and which were false, and which of the stories, true or false, uh, accelerated quicker, or went viral faster. What they found, unsurprisingly, fake news spreads far quicker than truth. I mean, literally, if you, want, if you want the numbers, a false story 
will reach the benchmark of 1,500 people. A false story will reach that benchmark six times faster than a true story. But a story is 70% more likely to go viral if it is fake than if it is true. What that says is human beings love fake news. And why is that? A part of it is the novelty, the intrigue, the anger that it stirs up inside of us, which, let me tell you, are the same motivators as for gossip. Problem is today, every click on that news story is monetized. And in the fierce competition for clicks, news stories or headlines that are sensationalized or false stories are going to get more clicks, going to get more finance, and that's why you're likely to be far more exposed to fake news than real. All of that to say, never before have we had to be so discerning and so disciplined as we engage with technology around us, particularly as it pertains to truth. So all I've done up till now, 20 minutes, is make us aware of how we're being shaped. And by now in the Rule of Life series, you'll know by the end we'll get to some disciplines or habits that are going to fortify and form our faith with what's happening around us. But for now, before I get there, before I just carry on railing against the internet like a, like a proper Luddite, is I actually want to point your attention to an alternative. It's not just about being restrained and disciplined in engaging the internet. Let's, what's the alternative? Where should we be looking for truth? And I think you're going to know the answer. But I came across a really helpful resource. It was just released this week. It's known as the Wisdom Pyramid. And it is based on the uh, kind of the concept of the food pyramid. It came out in the 90s. You know, the, the pyramid of the bottom layer is, I think, starch. And then the layer above it, it's supposed to describe, like, what proportions of food you should eat. And I think it's star, starch, dairy, meat. And then I, I can't remember. It's, like, totally out of date. We would never build a pyramid that way, right? But that's not the point. The point is the Wisdom Pyramid. So this guy describes the purport, different sources of information and the proportions in which we should engage with them. So if you want to pull that up um, on the screen, thanks, Candace. So just, just have a look at this. I'm going to mention this resource at the end. You can go check it out. But here are the six levels of the wisdom pyramid, the proportions in which we should be engaging information and searching for truth. The base layer, unsurprisingly, is what? The Bible. After that, the church. After that, surprisingly, but so interestingly, nature. Then, books. Like book books. Yes, real, like books. Then beauty or art, like music. And then right at the top, media and social media. At the smallest proportion of where we should be receiving our information or looking for truth or shaping our thinking, the smallest proportion should be the top. Now, think about it. Let's just be honest here with each other. If we're honest, you've got that pyramid in your mind. For most of us, that pyramid is flipped upside down where the majority of our time is spent on media, social media, and really the smallest portion of our time is spent meaningfully engaging with the Bible. And I want to just kind of talk about that for a moment, just that base layer. I would love to talk you through all these layers, but you can go and read the book. But let's talk about the Bible for a second as our primary source of mind-shaping truth. So I, I actually read my Bible on my phone. So in, so in my sort of daily readings, morning and evening, I read it on my phone because the reading plan's there and it keeps up to date and I can highlight things easily and I can copy and paste and put it in uh, all the productivity apps. Right? So I read the Bible on my phone. But here's the thing, but then I must don't lie, when I look at my screen time report, which I do every day, if I'm honest, the amount of time that has been spent on the Bible, it's there. 
the brute facts, the amount of time I spend, even in those two readings, is often, if, if not always, less, far less than WhatsApp, less even than Sport24, less even than Instagram, if I'm honest. For most of us, spurred, pyramid is upside down. And for Christians, come on guys, I mean, we know this. The Bible is a very source of our well-being. I just want to remind you of that. So he has this quote again by Tony Ranker, another one. He says this about the Bible. The Bible is not a book to get through, to read cover to cover, then put on a shelf. But neither is it a book to just browse or skim. The Bible is our open door to hear God's voice, both alone and together in community, a.k.a. church. It is intended to be bottomless in its profundity and endless in its relevance. It is less of a book and more of a world of revelation in which we live and move and have our being. This book gives us life and it moves and pushes God's redemptive plan forward. Can I hear an amen? No one in the studio, but are you at home? <laughs> and here's the thing that we have a serious problem if the primary source of our information, if the primary object of our attention spans, if the time, the primary time that we give to concentration, the limited time that we have that we give to concentrated focus on something, we have a serious problem if the primary source of all of that is social media and media and not the Bible. More than ever before, we needed to give our attention spans the object of our source of truth. And where we go to, to shape our thinking, has to be the Bible. Now, I, I, you all know this. I know that you know it. I mean, I know it too, and I struggle with it in my own life. And, and let me just give you a couple of quick reasons why reading the Bible today is harder than it's ever been before because of how we're shaped by our engagement with media around us. Just three quick ways. First, because we're used to now reading by scrolling, right? Just and we're reading 140 characters at a time, right, just blurbs or posts on Facebook. So we're getting used to reading through scrolling through blurbs of information. But you can't read the Bible like that. The Bible calls for a lot more of a slow, reflective process. So Psalm 1 that was read before the sermon Kind of the first instruction in this book of poetry of the Psalms to us is, so don't sit in the seat of scoffers, in a, you know. Don't look to the internet world where everyone has an opinion and sharing it with you. Don't look there for truth. So it's talking about now engaging with the Bible. And it says, but the person who delights in the law of the Lord, on his law he meditates day and night. The word meditate isn't, you know, some kind of you know, weird transcendent thing. It, it means to be thinking reflectively about day and night. But we're used to just scrolling through blurbs of information. We are also programmed now these days to seek out novelty. Yeah, because clicks. Because clicks are money. And so anything that's novel will get clicks. Whereas the reality is with the Christian life... You've been a Christian for a while. You know, it's not novel a lot of the time. I mean, I have this good friend of mine, one of my best friends, spent a lot of time together riding bikes, etc. And he's a good Christian guy, deacon in a church. But he'll often joke with me as like a pastor and a preacher, you know, and now that we're not at the same church. And what you're preaching on is, I'll bet you're just talking through that same book again, right? Every time I go to church, it's talking about the same book. And it's, he's joking, right? But it is the sense in the Christian life where we're just constantly looking for novelty and intrigue. And that's how we come across conspiracy theories and get so addicted to them because we're so used to being faced with what's novel 
And that's what gets clicks. And a lot of the Christian life is simply a long obedience in the same direction. Another way, oh, way that we're being programmed these days to not really engage with Scripture in a meaningful way is because it's the Bible. It may not be novel, but it surely is confrontational. I mean, you read it and it, you're confronted with stuff. Now, we've learned already in the sermon that we are programmed, our brains, with the wealth of information around us. Right? Our brains are programmed to choose the path of least resistance. That's why echo chambers and stuff exist. Whatever requires less processing power in my brain, I'm going to stick with that. So we stick with what we already know. But when it comes to the Bible, we're going to be confronted and offended. And we just kind of trained our brains to go with what doesn't offend, to reinforce what we already believe because that's easier and the Bible's not going to let you do that, which is why today reading the Bible takes a lot more discipline than it has ever taken before. So it's a rule of life. That's why there's habits coming up around it. So I want to end today by... Just, I'm just going to read one or two scriptures that Jesus speaks connecting the Bible and this idea of truth. So in John chapter 8, John is so much, so many times the word truth appears. In John chapter 8, Jesus said to the Jews that believed in him, If you abide in my word, if you live in my words, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. There's so many layers to that statement. I wish I could get into it, but I can't. But the first obvious layer is if you know the truth about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, you know the truth that it sets you free from slavery to sin, from its consequences, its destruction now and disconnection from God eternally. But also is this other layer. You will know truth. Jesus is truth. The Spirit is truth. God is truth. His very nature the way that he rules the world is in truth. You know, the Old Testament word for truth is this word emmet. It comes up just all over the show in the series. We've done a couple of little word studies here. But the root idea of, of emmet means steady. So when the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites, remember that story when Moses had his hands up, they were winning. And when his hands dropped because he got tired, they were losing. And guys come to hold Moses' hands up so that they don't shake. So that they were stable, the word used there is this truth, stability. The very heart of truth is this idea of stable. God is stable, meaning he is faithful, unchanging, reliable, steady. That's why often it's translated faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. You will know the faithfulness of God and it will set you free. If you've been disturbed by anything that I've said today, and I, maybe not disturbed by what I've said, but you're disturbed by you know, the world around you, all the effects of the internet age, just come to Jesus. Abide in His words. Abide here in a community that takes His words seriously. Build your life here on the faithfulness and stability of God, and that will give you your own anchor in this changing world. One last scripture, John chapter 18. As Jesus is before Pontius Pilate, he's about to be crucified. Pilate saying, hey, where's all your guys supporting you? And Jesus you know, says, my kingdom's not like that. They're not going to come and rescue me. In verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. You're not going to easily find answers to the kingdom of Jesus in, in the world. My servants would have been uh, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. It's what the world does, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So then Pilate said to him, so you're a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I've come into the world 
to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, says Jesus. What a great speech. And Pilate asks, man, what are you thinking? Pilate says, what is truth? That's exactly what the world is asking. But Jesus has already told him, me and my kingdom, that's what I'm pointing towards. And those who are of truth, who want to know truth, listen to my voice above all other voices. Let's pray. Jesus, help us. You have said that your sheep know your voice. So help us to know your voice. Build within us the disciplines we need to turn our ears, our eyes, our concentration to the source of truth. You, your words, and your story encapsulated in the Word of God. All of the distractions, all of the temptations, all of the destructive ways we've been shaped, would you convict us of it, highlight it in our lives so that we can be disciplined, discerning, and build our lives on this foundation of your words that are truth. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.